So, moving on to the next topic. I'm guessing that nobody here came to the Global Business Summit in an electric car. Um, but will the electric car become as ubiquitous as Facebook? To tell us what the future is going to hold, we have with us Martin Eberhardt, CEO of Tesla, who will talk on bracing for the e-vehicle revolution, and he'll be in conversation with Sriram, R. Sriram, Editor, West Economic Times. I invite both Mr. Martin Eberhard and R. Sriram to come on stage and begin their discussion on bracing for the e-vehicle revolution. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Kabir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us on the ET Global Business Summit. Uh, just to clarify one small point, Martin is the ex-CEO of Tesla. He's one of the co-founders of Tesla way back in 2003 when a lot of people, including many of us out here, thought internal combustion engine is here to stay <laughs> and stay for probably many, many decades or many centuries even. But uh, thanks to efforts to people like Martin, I think a lot of things have changed and a lot of things have... Uh, a big revolution has happened in the sense that we are now looking at a future where electric cars can actually replace. We're actually thinking of that. Electric cars can actually replace the internal combustion engine and, uh, uh, and lead our way to a uh, you know, brighter future. So let me just start our session by asking Martin this, this question about what was it that back in 2003 when nobody really, very few people were actually talking about it, uh, what made you start Tesla? And what were, what were really your vision and your, your dream at that time? So back in 2002, I was not an electric car enthusiast. I just knew that what we had been doing for the last 100 years was not going to last for the next 100 years. We couldn't, we, we couldn't continue to burn fossil fuels the way that we have. Something had to replace it. So I uh, studied every possible way of powering a car that I could think of. That was gasoline, diesel, biofuel, hydrogen fuel cells, and of course electric. Uh, and I calculated the actual well-to-wheel efficiency of every possible way I could think of to power a car. And it was a surprise to me to discover that the electric car was by far the most efficient way that we could power a car compared to everything else. Right. And, and that's how I became an enthusiast for making an electric car. Right, right. And what were the initial, what were the things that you really wanted to do at Tesla at that time? So, uh, in, in California, in the, in the late 90s, we had a thing called the Zero Emissions Vehicle Mandate. And right. this, this basically required every car company who wanted to sell cars in California to, smell, to sell a small number of electric cars also, proportional to the number of gasoline cars they sold. Right. And uh, the car companies did. There were kind of crummy electric cars available for sale in California in small numbers. But instead of spending their time trying to make better electric cars, the car companies spent their time lobbying the California government and managed to get the zero emissions vehicle mandate repealed. Right. So there were suddenly no more electric cars at all for sale in California, and even some of them were taken back and destroyed. And uh, this happened at the same time when I was understanding that electric cars were in fact were the future, that they were mm -hmm. the, the most efficient way to, to move a car. Right. So this to me looked like an opportunity. That on the one hand, my engineering experience teaches me that electric cars ought to be the future, and on the other hand, the companies who ought to be my competition are off for doing something else and have given up on electric cars. Right, right. And are you happy with the progress that has been made so far, given the fact that a lot of countries, a lot of governments, a lot of companies, have, big so, money is flowing into it? So the answer is yes, I am, I am delighted so far. There's a long way to go yet. But, but again, you know, in 2002, thank you to the existing car companies in that time, no car companies in the world were making electric cars. None. Not in China, not in Japan, not in Europe, not in the United States, not in India. Right. Uh, and, and there were two things that everybody knew about electric cars. That, that they sucked, that they were just unacceptable cars, and that they're dead. Nobody's making them. Right. right? And the purpose, the first purpose of, of Tesla was to change that completely, to, to, to make people understand that electric cars were the future. Right. So our first car, the Tesla Roadster, was a radical change from any electric car that had ever been made before. Instead of being a crummy fiberglass body on a, on a golf cart, what we made was an extreme fast sports car that was faster than any gasoline car out there. 
Right, right. And, and are you, uh, what, do you, what do you think of these faster sports car like electric cars that are now coming out in the market? I mean, is that the way to go? Well, it, it, it was necessary to prove to people that the electric cars were serious, that, right. that these were in fact better cars, at least in some measures, than the gasoline cars even 10 years ago. Right. Right. So uh, that, that, al that allows people to accept the electric car. It allows a car company to sell enough cars that they can begin to develop the technology to drive the prices down to eventually make electric cars that fit in every price category. Right. There is a Canadian company which is now coming out or has already launched a three-seater car, Solo, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is priced a lot cheaper, I think, than the Tesla. I, I've uh, seen, is that the way to go? I've, I've seen electric cars of, <laughs> of every kind. <clears throat> and the, the electric car that's the right car for one market is different for, than for another market. Right. So maybe here in India, uh, the the three-seater smaller electric car is a great idea, maybe right. to replace some of these little gasoline-powered, I guess you call them tuk-tuks. Right, uh, right. Yeah. What do you think of the uh, Indian government's approach to the electric vehicle policy? I mean, there is a lot of talk about how by 2030 we will all move to electric cars. Nobody knows whether that will happen in such, short, such short a time. Uh, but the steps that the government has taken, the overall policy towards having more electric cars on the roads, uh, what do you think needs to be done? So, so I, I'm in favor of every push from every government to make electric cars happen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. of course, if you look over in China, the Chinese government is promoting electric cars in a very, very big way. And as a result, you see many Chinese startup companies making very high profile electric car announcements. Right. Um, right. I think that India should be doing the same thing. I right. think that we, we, should, we should try to move away from the gasoline cars here as fast as possible. Right. And are we doing that as fast? I think um, there's more to be done. There's more to be done, of yes. course. Of course. Uh, tell me something, just to you know, shift the topic, shift the conversation a little bit now. Uh, during the Californian gold rush, it was basically said that the, the big money was not made by the miners. The big money was made by the logistics guys or the transporters or the, you know, the shovel makers. Uh, so is that, is that what also you are trying to do with, uh, with your firm, with your startup? Uh, you know, the battery uh, sharing technology, uh, you know, that's where the money is? So, yeah, my, my current company is a little startup company called Tivani. Right. And, and uh, we are working on battery technology. Right. Uh, but I, I don't know if it's really the, quite ana the right analogy. I mean, it, in an electric car, the battery is the most expensive, heaviest, mm -hmm. least reliable, most dangerous part of the car. Right. So if you're not designing the car around the battery, you're doing it wrong. So for me, if we get the battery technology right, the cars follow. Right. And uh, what kind of progress have you made on battery technology so far? Well, a lot. I mean, uh, when I started Tesla, nobody had ever made a car with lithium-ion batteries before. And we pioneered the idea of building a battery system using many, many small cells to make a big battery for the car. Right. Uh, and that was a great idea then. Uh, mm -hmm. But I've been thinking about the same problem for a long time, and we can do it better now. Right, right. And do you think, uh, you know, Kabir Bedi yeah. just mentioned uh, in the opening remarks that will electric cars become as ubiquitous as Facebook? Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, so, so uh, Tesla has proved already that the future of cars will be electric. We can debate about when will it be, but we're, I think we're not very long from now when the majority of cars sold will be electric cars. Uh, I, I think it's also a fair question, especially when you look at the traffic here in Delhi, to ask whether cars are the answer at all for at least uh, urban environments like this. Right. I, I mean, if I took all the cars out in the street and replaced them today with electric cars, it's still a giant traffic jam. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So what do you think is the answer? Probably in urban areas like this, it's a different kind of transportation, whether that's subways or, or, or light rail or something. But I think that, that uh, sitting in a traffic jam, as we do in Delhi, is, is, uh, is not the answer in the long run. It's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not just Delhi, probably everywhere else in the country, at least in the major cities. But tell me something. Again, I'd like to go back and uh, talk a little more deep, deeper about, about the electric cars. Lithium, uh, is it a problem? No. Or is it made out to be a problem? <laughs> so uh, <coughs> lithium is used in batteries uh, uh, as the transport for energy within the batteries. And, and lithium has kind of a special place on the periodic table. It's a very small ion. It's, remember, the periodic table, it's hydrogen and then helium and then lithium. It's the, it's the third smallest right. atom. So right. it makes a very good transport for that material. But uh, it, it turns out there are a few places in the world, Bolivia being one of them, where there are fields of just basically lithium salt lying on the ground in, in almost pure form. You can scrape it up and use it. And that, that will eventually be used up. But lithium is common on Earth. The ocean is full of lithium. And on top of that, unlike oil, 
With oil, when you make gasoline and you put it in your car and you burn it, it's gone. Right. But the lithium in the battery, even at the end of life, every lithium ion is still there. Right. So right. you can recycle them. And once we have an inf infrastructure of electric cars, the batteries will just be recycled and used again. And it's not a rare earth metal. We don't need to be afraid of the Chinese. That's no. what you're saying? It's, yes, yeah, it's not dangerous. It's not like, it's not like that. Uh, tell me, the, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about data protection and privacy. And as we all know, the automobile industry is also, uh, there's a lot of software that is going into the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose with electric cars, when it's more modern, super modern, powerful electric cars that may come out in the next five, 10 years, the role of software and technology is gonna be very, very, very high. Mm -hmm. uh, are Already any, is. Are there any data issues there? Are there any privacy concerns there? A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I think that we, as a as a society, need to decide what we believe about privacy. Right. Um, I'm not sure how many conversations you've had with teenagers about privacy, but my experience is that people who are younger than we are don't care so much about privacy. They put everything in the they know anyways up on Facebook. <laughs> but uh, I think that we need to grow up about this. We need to understand who owns what data and and who should be harvesting that and who should be ma making use of it. So I'll, uh, I'll want you to hold on to that thought. What exactly are the dangers here, especially when you're driving modern electric cars fitted with modern well, software? So I, I think there's, there's two different ways of looking at, at, at the dangers. There's dangers around privacy and, you know, do you want people to really know exactly where you are at all the time and what speed you were driving and everything like that. But, but there's also the, the whole question about reliability of, of the software. You know, especially as you start thinking about autonomous cars, the amount of software that's in an autonomous car is astounding. It's, it's, yeah. it's a crazy amount. And that software is, um, is, is running life-critical operations. So it's one thing, for example, if you have a bug in your, in your smartphone and your app crashes and it reloads and whatever, and you're just slightly annoyed. It's something different if that software is controlling the steering or the brakes on your car. Right. So we don't, as yet, have the technology to write provably correct software. Software that can prove does what I say it's going to do. We don't want to do that. Right, one last question, uh, because we're running really out of time. Uh, autonomous cars, self-driving cars, what are your thoughts on those? Well, this is back to my question about software. Right. <laughs> so so. I'm, I, I think that we need to proceed with caution. Um, I, I kind of think it's, it's the genie has come out of the bottle and we're gonna have right. a hard time stopping it, but I think we need to pay attention. And I think that we need to pay attention from, from the perspective of software reliability. Right. We need to pay attention to from the perspective of hacking. Right. I mean, what happens if I hack into a network of, of uh, autonomous cars and make them misbehave in some bad way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we need to think about it from a social perspective. That, that, you know, something like a quarter to a third of people in the world are employed in one way or another in the driving business. Right. Whether that's trucks or cars or taxi cabs or limos or whatever. And, uh, and this is because it's a, it's a job that relatively unskilled people can, can do. Right. Uh, what are we going to do with these people when we take away that occupation? We need to think about that. You need to think about that. Yeah. Yes, of course. Very valid points. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for this wonderful discussion. And I'm afraid we only have time for all this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And please give Martin Eberhard a big hand. One of the pioneers of the electric car, electric vehicle movement. Thank you, Martin.